Good evening to you all and welcome to the Tuesday, October 9th, 2018 meeting of the Falls Church City Council. We are delighted you all are with us this evening and I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Clerk, will you call roll, please? Yes, sir. Ms. Conley? Here. Mr. Duncan? Here. Ms. Hardy? Here. Mr. Lickenhouse? Here. Mr. Snyder? Here. Mr. Z? Here. And Mayor Tarter? Here. Thank you, Council. Thank you. All right, let's move on to uh, adoption of the meeting agenda. Is there a motion regarding the meeting agenda? Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt the meeting agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, I thought, uh, anyway, all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, the ayes have it. We have a meeting agenda. We also have a number of proclamations and special presentations this evening. It's a special evening for us uh, tonight. Our first one relates to Energy Awareness Month, and Mr. Z, who spent a uh, considerable part of his career at the Department of Energy, is uh, gonna do the honors tonight. So, Mr. Z. Thank you, Mayor. I'm honored to read this. Whereas the City Council adopted the Regional Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Goals developed by the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments as its own goals applicable to the city government as well as residents and businesses and Council further resolved to take actions to achieve these greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals and Council also adopted a resolution affirming these commitments and resolving to continue to advocate for regional, state, and federal support to promote and protect an environment that is healthy for generations to come, and whereas addressing energy efficiency and clean local energy production promotes a cleaner environment, a more prosperous economy, and positive economic development, improved comfort and health in homes and businesses at lower cost and a higher quality of life, and the vision of environmental sustainability in the city of Falls Church incorporates energy efficiency and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as core values and embody what the city is striving to achieve. And whereas October is Energy Awareness Month, a national effort to secure a more prosperous and energy independent future, which depends partly on the ability to address shared energy challenges and encourage diverse, clean, and efficient energy production and whereas the City of Falls Church demonstrates leadership in environmental sustainability through multiple environmental programs led by the Environmental Sustainability Council, whose membership of nine city residences is supplemented by many volunteers participating in three subcommittees, education, habitat restoration, and energy transition, and by high school student representatives. And the ESC's Energy Transition Subcommittee has demonstrated leadership in encouraging energy efficiency and clean energy use in public buildings, businesses, and homes, including supporting Energy Star performance monitoring of public buildings, the availability of thermal cameras for loan from the Mary Riley Stiles Public Library, the registration of the City of Falls Church as a green power community, promoting and supporting the installation of solar power for homes and businesses, and evaluating and promoting the use of geothermal resources for school buildings and this, whereas the city uses clean biodiesel in its large trucks, buses, and hybrid cars has replaced all traffic signals and more than 130 streetlights with high efficiency LED lighting is progressively replacing lighting in public facilities with LEDs and actively promotes energy conversation. Hang with me folks. And <laughs> whereas guidance to make homes and businesses more energy efficient is readily available through the United States Department of Energy, the Air Virginia Energy Efficiency Council, and the city's web pages. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, mayor of the city of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim October 2018 as Energy Action Month in the city of Falls Church and encourage staff, residents, businesses and organizations to commit to take actions this month and in the future to conserve energy and reduce carbon emissions. Do we have anybody from the ESC or uh, other person who's to receive this award tonight? Uh, Mayor Tarter, 
If anybody from the audience would like to receive this uh, petition, we'd, we'd certainly welcome them to do so. Kate Walker was intending to be here, but she was detained and not able to attend tonight's meeting. So I'd be happy to accept it. Let's um, give it to the kids, Mayor. And, uh, <laughs> but we, we will this. certainly pro uh, uh, publicize this proclamation. Sure. I hope she wasn't detained for bad reason. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure if, the, if uh, the kids and maybe the, the city, uh, the wide as well, would like to come and get that, that would be fine. Um, I'd also like to congratulate and thank uh, Councilman Z for his work both in the region and the state. Uh, Councilman Z is the chair of the uh, Council of Governments Committee on the Environment and also on the state, um, the VML State Board. So let's go ahead and give this award. You guys want some pins also? There you go. All right, let's get all the kids down here. What do you say? The energy kids. <laughs> You have to turn around and smile pretty. The light's hiding people. All right, looks like I see everybody's faces. Okay, no wiggling in the center for just one second. <laughs> it is. Okay, now it's why I can wiggle again. Yeah. You're good to go. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, our next proclamation uh, relates to uh, September 15th through October 15th as Hispanic Heritage Month. And Councilman, Councilwoman Hardy is gonna do the honors. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, before I read the proclamation, I just wanted to recognize that we have really diverse representation in our audience, and so I'll invite, um, at the end of reading this, um, anyone who would like to speak. I think we have a member of the audience who actually will read the version of this in Spanish, since we had this translated, since this is the first time we are recognizing Hispanic Heritage Month in Falls Church. So without further ado, whereas the Hispanic presence and influence in the United States of America dates back to the early 1500s, and whereas Latinos have participated throughout the history of the United States in support and in defense of the principles and ideals upon which this country was founded, and whereas Hispanics have made significant contributions in all phases of our economic, social, cultural, and political life, and whereas Latinos account for approximately 11% of the city of Falls Church's population and more than 50 million residents in the United States, and whereas Hispanics constitute a diverse group with origins in 21 different Spanish-speaking countries in the world whose heritage links them with North, Central, and South America, the Caribbean islands, Africa, Asia, and Europe, whereas Latinos contribute to the great diversity and unity of the city of Falls Church with a rich history of different cultures, racial and ethnic backgrounds, and ancestry within Hispanic communities, and whereas as a community and as a government, we are proud of the cultural enrichment brought by the diversity of the Hispanic population. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim September 15th through October 15th, 2018 as Hispanic Heritage Month in the City of Falls Church and urge all citizens to join and support the city's celebration of the rich heritage of our Hispanic residents. So I wanted to call it that we have in the audience um, Julio Cesar Drobo, who's the former chair of our housing commission, um, Carlos Ventura, who is um, one of our newest businesses in the city um, with El Patron. Um, we have Anna Latonia from Dean Our Associates and Friends, um, and Sonia Ruiz Bolanos, who is um, part of our school community. Um, she's actually been doing work in translating all of the PTA communication in Spanish, which has been really great because as a first generation immigrant myself where English is not my native language, I know that really makes a difference in, in those families' lives. So thank you for doing that work. So everyone come up and um, read the Spanish version. We'll do um, the official presentation. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Welcome. Considerando que la presencia e influencia hispanas en los Estados Unidos de América datan de principios del siglo XVI y considerando que a lo largo de la historia de los Estados Unidos los latinos han participado en apoyo y defensa de los principios e ideales en los que se fundamenta este país y considerando que los hispanos han contribuido de manera importante en todas las fases de nuestra vida económica, social, cultural y política y considerando que los latinos latinos representan aproximadamente el 11% de la población de la ciudad de Falls Church y suman más de 50 millones de residentes en los Estados Unidos y considerando que los hispanos constituyen un grupo diverso con orígenes en 21 diferentes países hispanohablantes del mundo, cuyos antepasados los vinculan con Norte, Centro y Sudamérica, las islas del Caribe, África, Asia y Europa, 
y considerando que los latinos contribuyen a la gran diversidad y unidad de la ciudad de Falls Church con una rica historia de diferentes culturas, orígenes raciales e étnicos y linaje de las comunidades hispanas y considerando que como comunidad y como gobierno estamos orgullosos del enriquecimiento cultural que nos brinda la diversidad de la población hispana. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, what's that? <laughs> you know, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you, gracias, is all I can say. And you're welcome to say anything else. If you'd like to make any remarks, we would be happy to hear from you, any of you. No, 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 please, no ladies first, no, ladies first. Well, yes. no, I just, um, as a Hispanic woman, I want to thank you guys for the recognition, and I couldn't be prouder to belong to this amazing community. So thank you so much. So much. We're delighted to have you as part of it. Uh, first of all, I want to just to thank you, all of you, members of city council, uh, city staff, for recognizing this and for celebrating our culture. It is really important for us. I think my heritage, it is a big part of my life. You know, I was born in Spain, I grew up in Colombia, and now I'm an American, and always have my heritage in me, my passion, the sense of family is always with me, and the sense of serving the community where I live. That's what I did for the 17 years that I live here in this city, and I'm proud to have been a resident of this city. <coughs> I'm proud that you celebrate this, because celebrating Hispanic heritage, it is for me a representation of diversity and inclusion, something that we don't have nowadays. That is really important. And for me, my heritage, it is always my Spanish, my Spanish, which is already spoken by more than 53 million people in this country. Thank you so much for allowing us to celebrate our culture. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Why don't you come forward for a picture? But well said. Absolutely. absolutely. Right. All right, uh, Mayor and Mr. Snyder, I think we're going to have to split this time. Oh, yeah. And the center people come in tight. Yeah, I'm, lo I'm losing Mr. Snyder. No, this <laughs> that's good, Wyatt. All right, I'm not as good as Claire doing this. One, two, three, and again, and again. Are you guys good? All right, our last proclamation this evening relates to Fire Prevention Week. And Mr. Snyder, uh, who does volunteer work in that area, is going to do the honors. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Whereas the City of Falls Church is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living and visiting the city, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 2,735 people in the United States in 2016, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 352,000 home fires, and whereas the majority of U.S. fire deaths occur at home each year, and whereas residents should identify places in their homes where fires can start and eliminate those hazards, and whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and whereas residents should install smoke detectors in every sleeping room outside each separate sleeping area and on every level of the home, and whereas residents should respond to a smoke alarm by going outside immediately to a designated meeting place. And whereas people who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas the 2018 Fire Prevention Week theme, look, listen, learn, be aware, fire can happen anywhere, effectively serves to remind people that they need to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire. And whereas the Falls Church Volunteer Fire Department's annual open house 
will take place on Saturday, October 13, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., and will include tours of the fire station, a meet and greet with Sparky the Fire Dog, and the 100th birthday celebration for Old Tom, the department's Model T fire engine. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim October 7th through 13th, 2018, as Fire Prevention Week in the City of Falls Church and urge citizens to be aware of their surroundings, look for available ways out in the event of fire or other emergency, respond when a smoke alarm sounds by exiting the building immediately, and to support the public safety activities offered during Fire Prevention Week 2018. Mr. Shields, is there anyone here from the fire department that you're aware of? Uh, we do not have anyone uh, here tonight. I'd be happy to accept this on behalf of our, of our um, acting chief, Joseph Rushatar with Arlington County, and the chief of our volunteers, uh, Kevin Henry, and our fire marshal, Tom Palera. That would be great. And Mr. Snyder, I believe you're still a volunteer. <laughs> EM <laughs> hey. That was not planned. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Well, everybody did what they're supposed to, didn't they? They went outside when they heard the alarm, so that was good. Um, but uh, anyway, so I think for the moment, we will just keep this uh, proclamation ourselves. The fire people are out doing what they should be doing, and we thank them for the good work. And we thank you, Dave, for your still volunteer EMT, are you not? And you were at the Pentagon on 9-11 weren't you? New York, okay. Yeah, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to hand this proclamation to you, given that our fire folks are out uh, doing firefighting and the like, but uh, thank, thank you to all of them. Um, why don't we move on to our next item, which is a briefing on election security. So, you ready, Mr. Bjorki? Our registrar. Mayor, City Council, I am David Berkey, Director of Elections and General Registrar of Voters for the City of Falls Church. And speaking of emergency preparedness, had this been an election, our election officers would have taken our equipment and our ballots outside and continued to vote voters, as we have done in the past. Uh, election security is serious this year, and I can tell you that because our current uh, voter registration and in-person absentee numbers are uh, about as high as a presidential election, and these are the midterms. So it's, uh, in fact, our in-person absentee has now reached 2% of voters. And for context, it took until about October 20th in 2014, the last midterms, before we reached 1%. So I have a feeling, statistically, that we're going to break all in-person and absentee records that we've had, including in presidential elections. I'm not saying we're going to beat presidential turnout numbers. We won't know that till Election Day. Uh, but if anything, uh, like last year's 2017 gubernatorial election, uh, we are looking to beat almost every other non-presidential election as far as turnout is concerned. So security has been t being discussed, and it's very important. And when it comes to an election system, I want our voters to understand that there's actually two systems involved, and they are symbiotic. One is the actual ballot system. And so it's a computer that creates the ballot, that creates media that goes to our paper-based scanners. We are now on a paper-based system since last year. And then those, that media that goes into the paper-based scanners uh, collects the ballots through Election Day and then goes back to the computer that created the ballot. The computer that creates the ballot then tallies all of those results at the end. But you also have separate tallies from each scanner at each of the precincts, including in absentee. Once uh, that computer that has the ballot creation and the ballot tallying is never connected to the internet. So it's a closed system from one computer to several scanners back to that computer. You know, we get the software programmed from the vendor, and it never gets updated until we have to go through several layers of, um, of security, both at the federal level and the state level, before we can even update uh, those computers. So the ballot system is closed, and it is now a paper-based system. The other system that you may hear about with uh, the news uh, talking about scanning systems and being able to change information all has to do with voter registration. 
And Virginia does have an online voter registration system. So you can go to the Virginia Department of Elections, uh, you can look up your voter record, and uh, you can apply, uh, especially online, if you have a Virginia DMV ID. It has a customer number on there that will port your signature from your DMV ID over to your voter registration, so we can do that online. Uh, and if you don't have a DMV ID, you can print out that application and send it to us. And if you're listening right now and you haven't done this, please, you can do it from your smartphone. Just Google Virginia Department of Elections, check your voter registration, take a screenshot. We want you to take a screenshot because if anything gets quote unquote hacked, it's going to be a voter registration database. So if they're going to manipulate anything, it's at that level. So if you take a screenshot, we'll have you'll have all of the information necessary so that when you do go vote, and if there is a problem, we can research that. That said, we also have electronic poll books, which we are using both in absentee and at the polling places that are independent databases from the online system. So that we have already downloaded this information and we keep checking it, but we also have separate off-media databases that are not connected to our computers so that we can do a historical database search. So if you know that you checked your registration tonight on October 9th and everything looked good, and then you go to the polling place on election day and suddenly you're not on the rolls, you had that picture that you took. We can take the information off that picture and search our past databases to see if our information matches your information. Now it has to match our information because otherwise somebody could just edit a photo and we certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, but we are doing these several steps, these backups to backups to make sure that no matter what happens at, at the internet control, uh, the online portals, uh, that, you're, that you can be assured that we have processes in place and that your name will be on the rolls on election day. We're also making sure that our in-person absentee is, is, is solid as well, so that if you have any reason to believe that you won't be able to go on, uh, to the polls on election day, and it could be just leaving the city of Falls Church for any reason whatsoever, come in and see us, check your voter registration. If you're already registered, you can go ahead fill out an absentee ballot and, and, uh, and cast your ballot. It's very quick. Go ahead and ask the already 180 voters that we've had so far. Uh, they've all been very impressed with how fast our process is. It's interesting that we're having this many people this early in the coziest of spaces that I've ever been in. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, we really think the process is working very well right now. And I think you can, I think the City of Falls Church voters uh, can, uh, be safe and assured that their, that their votes will count on election day and turnout, turnout's great. But I do also want to answer any questions you may have about the system and about the process. All right, well thank you for that presentation. We appreciate all your good work. Are there any questions at this point? Mr. Z. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the last election, the presidential election, um, uh, the city had to go through extraordinary steps uh, uh, almost at, at the 11th hour to uh, ensure our, our systems were in compliance with uh, with standards uh, and as I recall the standards were changed uh, two weeks before the election and uh, but fortunately you uh, had ordered the new <coughs> machine so my question uh, then is um, have there been um, additional certification issues that have arisen? Are these the same systems and do they remain certified? So yeah, last year during the gubernatorial elections, um, in August of 2017, uh, there, uh, the State Board of Elections for Virginia decertified all DREs, Digital Recording Electronic Machines, throughout the state. Uh, that came from a convention called DEFCON where they had a voting village and they had some people come in and try to hack it, sort of a white hat hackathon, uh, and they were, uh, they were able to do some things that uh, you wouldn't expect them to be able to do. That said, they did not have the same system that we had. 
uh, for uh, for that election, uh, for that uh, hackathon. Now the uh, State Board of Elections did want to research all DREs. They did get a um, a version of the voting machines that we used to have, uh, as well as several others from around the state, uh, lots of vendors, um, and they had Vita uh, test it. And from that report, uh, while there was nothing specifically that they found about the system that we were using, uh, the State Board of Elections decided we're just going to decertify all DREs. Uh, what was left then were four systems that were all Opti uh, all digital scan, which is different from the old optical scan paper ballots. It's a digital scan paper ballot system. So it actually takes a picture of the ballot, stores that picture, and counts from the picture, uh, whereas the ballot then uh, drops into the ballot box where it stays secure and then will go to the circuit court after the election uh, to, uh, to stay secure. Uh, so there has not been any issues at all with the certification of digital scan uh, paper ballot systems, no. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you much for your great work. Thank Look you. Look forward to an uh, event-free election. Um, all right, so our next item is oaths of office to uh, new boards and commission members. Do we have any oaths of office to administer? No, sir. All right. Um, let's move on now to the receipt of public comment. Um, do you want to summarize the written comments for us? Yes. Um, Alex Baruxas of 301 Grove Avenue provided suggestions for traffic, traffic control at Founders Row. Marsha Hertzberg of 444 West Broad Street wrote about concerns with parking near Northside Social. Uh, Laura Gogol of 308 Pine Street wrote about concerns with a Founders Row signage, as did Lisa Baruxas of 301 Grove Avenue. Bridget Craft, 335 Riley Street, forwarded videos and comments about uh, construction on Riley Street. Park Tower residents wrote about trash and recycling services for their condo complex. Rosalie Cosbelt of 531 Great Falls Street wrote with suggestions for tra traffic calming at West and Lincoln, and um, also staff had uh, several emails from the public about uh, traffic in that area. Um, Catherine Posey, 210 East Fairfax Street, apartment 422, urge, urged council to support solar energy initiatives. And then Rosalie Cosbelt um, also wrote about uh, Lincoln Park playground drainage issues. All right, thank you very much. So now we'll move on to public comment. And so if anyone in the audience wishes to speak, I would ask you to fill out a speaker slip, as some of you have already done which are in the back of the room. And uh, when you get up to speak, if you could state your name and address for the record, and please keep your comments to three minutes uh, so that we can all be heard tonight. If you prefer to speak when an item of interest is to be heard tonight, you're welcome to, to pass and speak at that time. Um, so let me go ahead and get on uh, with this. If, again, if you haven't filled out a speaker slip, please do so now. Our first speaker is Ben Cosbelt. Ben, are you here? All right. Come on down. All right, welcome. Hello. Hello. I'm Ben Cosbelt, and I'm here to talk about the bus issues at the Lincoln Park area. When I go to the bus stop in the morning, um, there, when I cross the crosswalk, there are like about 25% of the cars just like speed by. And I had one experience where um, a car actually tried to beat me across the crosswalk. And then coming back in the afternoon, it was basically the same as the morning, but there are these like huge bushes that block the sight of the Lincoln Great Falls crossing, so you can't really see if any cars or any other vehicles are coming, so you'll have to like take a step into the road and if there's a car coming, jump back so you won't so you'll avoid getting hit. And so maybe we could like trim the bushes down or something that would help you see better so you could see the cars even if they didn't see you. That's like a fine idea. And I tell you when you're done and some of the other speakers are done, we're gonna ask the city manager to see what his thoughts are on that. But that's a great suggestion. I thank you for coming out. You did a great job. Would you like a pen as well? I, oh, you already get one? <laughs> okay, all right. right. Thank you. Um, okay, well, nice work. 
Uh, our next speaker is Rosalie Cosbelt. Hi, I'm Rosalie Cosbelt. Uh, I live at 531 Great Falls Street, which is between West and Lincoln on the Lincoln Park playground side of the street with the sidewalk. Um, <laughs> so I also have notes. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, I came to express concerns about um, the safety of on Great Falls Street in that block in particular, and it's sort of a two-part problem. At the west end, so Fairfax County ends there, and the speed limit actually drops when you cross West Street, but the road opens, and so the habit is to speed up because the road has opened, um, and Lincoln is at the end, and so a lot of people who are going onto 66 or who are going for the train station speed up to get to that end. So um, as I sent in the written comment a week ago today, someone who was not inebriated but was not paying close attention swerved to avoid a parked car on um, the street and drove up past the sidewalk onto our grass, into our yard, crashed into our tree, knocked over a lamppost across our yard and into the neighbor's yard, um, going at a considerable speed. Um, and there's no evidence that they were able to apply the brakes in time. Uh, the police didn't think that it, they said it happened so quickly that you probably couldn't. Um, the airbags deployed in that car, the windshield was shattered. I mean, so it's just an indication of how quickly people are driving when they come around either that corner or when they cross west coming down. So ideally there would be some sort of calming at the front end of the street. And then to echo Ben's comment, I have children at, um, on all three buses for, so I have a kindergartner, I have a TJ kid and I have a middle schooler. And so the combined number of children at Ben's bus stop with the middle school and high school, he told me there are 15 children there. The, um, we counted this morning, there are 14 for the TJ bus. There are eight for the Mount Daniel bus. If half of them bring in adults, um, we're talking about 30 people every morning sort of milling around the edge of the um, street. And it would be great if there was some calming measures, um, like Ben said, for those who have to cross over, the bushes really need to be trimmed. Um, I'm a huge fan of the idea of a flashing crosswalk, um, anything to, to change because people are, people adapt. So I saw that there is a, a speed sign, which I very much appreciate. Um, I would love if there was occasional enforcement, um, just so that people suddenly thought, well, maybe today is an enforcement day. Anything that is the same all the time, people adapt to. So a flashing crosswalk indicates a person actually in the crosswalk, maybe that would do something as well. But I would love to see some sort of calming measure at that end, in particular at the times when the kids are getting on and off the bus. Um, and as a very last point, I just wanted to say there had been mentioned that maybe if there was more parking on the street that this would help. Um, and I want to discourage that from being a plan um, for having children who cross this street. Um, it would not be great because they pop out between cars. Um, and we've had people get hit for who park on the street, which is why they don't park on the street. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Our next speaker is Liz Weatherly, followed by Margaret Schwartz. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm Liz Weatherly, uh, Rosalie's neighbor at 525 Great Fall Street. And I am also coming to talk to you about the traffic, um, both the speed and the volume of traffic that I've observed along Great Fall Street in the nine and a half years that I've lived there. Um, I have two kids that get on the bus for TJ. We've been going to the Lincoln Park bus stop for, um, so, you know, since the older one was in kindergarten. And in that time, I have noticed a marked increase in the speed and the volume and the mix of traffic that comes through, particularly in the morning. There are more and more heavy trucks coming through despite the no through street sign, which I think means they're prohibited from going through unless they have business there on that street. So. Like Rosalie, I would request um, that there be more periodic enforcement of both the no through trucks and the, um, the speed that, um, that people go going through there. I had an incident last week, just two days after this car wound up in Rosalie's tree. We were at the bus stop in the morning at Lincoln Park and several, there was a family waiting to cross Dorchester um, at the crosswalk, several cars just drove straight through. One did stop and let this family go through, and another one came up right on his tail, on the horn, swerving toward the 25 or so people that were at and around the bus stop. 
um, I was really irritated and um, yelled at them and, and let them know that there were pedestrians in the crosswalk, at which point the driver yelled back to me that he was trying to make the green light at Lincoln. And this is not unusual. This could happen every several, every couple several weeks. So um, I thank you very much for the speed sign that went up. Ms. Hardy in particular, I feel like you were really responsive when I did reach out to you pretty upset last week, so thank you for that. Um, but it is temporary, um, and whether it is speed cushions, um, I don't want to prescribe what the answer is, and I know there are a lot of considerations that go into it, but I'd ask that you please continue to prioritize that Great Falls, Lincoln Park, Lincoln intersection um, as the town continues to grow. So thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Margaret Schwartz, followed by Christine Brooks. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Margaret Schwartz. I live at 313 Lincoln Avenue. I'm actually here to talk a little bit about some of the same issues. But specifically, I want to ask what the status is of um, sidewalks in the city, particularly on Great Falls at the um, end of the uh, WLED to uh, the corner of Lincoln and Great Falls, as well as that intersection. I mean, let's face it. People are still walking in the streets in this city, and I think it's very dangerous. We've spent a lot of money to build um, a new school, to renovate the library and the city hall, but I feel like we're still being short-sighted in the infrastructure for pedestrians in the city. Um, I also feel that there is even no crosswalk um, at the intersection of Lincoln and Great Falls for children to walk safely from one side to the other because it's not um, a perfect uh, 90 degree angle. It's very easy for cars to miss pedestrians crossing from one side to the other. And lastly, I attended the meeting when the city showed what they were gonna do with the crosswalks on Lincoln Avenue and I asked the individual making the presentation about having flashing lights on either side of the street and I was told that, oh, there wasn't any money for that. And I'm like, really, you're gonna do all this and then you're not gonna put flashing lights to warn the drivers that there is a crosswalk, especially in the early morning during the winter when it's dark out and these kids are crossing the street. I feel it was a very short-sighted approach and I would just like to hear any feedback about my comments as far as sidewalks and other safety issues. All right, well, we're going to take public comment now from everyone, and then we're going to hear from the city manager. So hopefully your concerns will be get addressed. I can tell you that as a council as a whole, we're very interested in walkability, crosswalks, bikeability. We've tried to make that our priority the past couple of years, and I hope that you've noticed improvements even on Lincoln with the crosswalk that was put in there, I think, in the past maybe months, if not years. So, so we are trying. Uh, there's a lot of folks all over the city that I've have the same interests, and I, we're doing kind of as quick as we can, but... This may be something that deserves some special attention. I certainly look forward to hearing what the city manager happens to say. Well, and again, the, option, the opportunity to do that was when they were building all this out, and, and I was told flat out, we don't have the money to put in a flashing lights on either side of the crosswalk. So. Well, I mean, again, I don't know the specifics of the, the flashing lights, but I mean, we have tried to prioritize all over the city our budget for traffic calming, which is not as much as many of us would like, but we have a lot of competing priorities in the city right now. But we are certainly working at it, and I hope we can find a solution that works for everyone. And when we're done with our speakers, I'm going to ask the city manager to comment on what we're hearing tonight from you and the other folks in this neighborhood. We understand it's a concern, and it's a concern to all of us here in the dais as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Brooks. Welcome. Six months, my car has been. 
All right, our next speaker is William Schmidl, followed by Bob Smith. I'm Bill Schmidl, and uh, I live at 312 Pennsylvania, and this is my daughter Sophie. Um, good evening, uh, and uh, thank you for allowing me to, the time to uh, address a few important issues um, that Liz Weatherly uh, originally brought up um, to a few people on the council. Um, the critical issue is uh, for both pedestrians and drivers, and it's been addressed by uh, several people this evening. In fact just about everybody, and that is the Great Falls-Lincoln uh, Strip, that area. It's quite dangerous, and for us in particular, we, since we live on Pennsylvania and we're trying to have to cross the street to go to the park or uh, to uh, go to the bus stop or to visit friends uh, we have in other neighborhoods, there's no traffic signals for the, the kids to, to try to figure out when they're supposed to cross. Um, that's particularly dangerous when you're dealing with people taking rights on red. It's, it's allowed. They're going to do it at that particular intersection. And the foliage and just the setup of the, the, uh, the crosswalk makes it very dangerous for kids. And they, you, you're, what you're asking them to do, if I'm not accompanying them, is for them to make a judgment call as to whether that driver's going to stop or not. And I don't want them to be making that call. I really would like them to be able to see a hand or a person walking in a little signal to know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it makes it very easy for them. Um, we've, gone, uh, we've gone to that bus stop for now five years. And I can tell you we've had to dodge traffic several times when people have come close to hitting us. Specifically, folks who are trying to run, the, trying to uh, beat the light, or people who are trying to make a right on red. And, uh, and we're always trying to judge whether they're going to actually stop for us or not. <clears throat> so, you know, we've got a few proposals. Um, we'd like pedestrian signs, signals, to be put up for the uh, Great Falls Lincoln intersection for the children. Um, we'd like a sign put up, um, no turn on red when pedestrians are present, so that hopefully people will actually recognize that pedestrians may be present. And then, in, most importantly, and people have talked, enforcement. Um, once in a blue moon, we'll see a police car out there, but we'd like them out there more often, especially when the bus, buses are running. Because I think all of us have seen folks run by, drive around the buses. Um, this is particularly prevalent when uh, the cameras were turned off. Um, I don't know if it's as prevalent now. So uh, members of the council, I would just, I, I do the, think this, um, require some special attention, um, then not be put into the, the cat C process for traffic calming that usually is in neighborhoods, but rather look at this as a separate issue specifically for kids' safety, specifically with regard to buses and with regard to the park. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And would your now, daughter like to say something yes, as well? Yes, she would. All right. Hi, I'm Sophia Schmidl. Um, I live on 312 Pennsylvania Avenue, Falls Church, Virginia. And when me, I'm in third grade, my brother's in fifth, and when m next year I'll be in fourth grade, and my brother will be in sixth in a new school, and I'll have to walk all the way to the bus stop and back all alone because my, either my dad would be working in the morning or stuff like that. So uh, if you could put a signal so I and my brother could see um, where when we cross because usually it's my brother's judgment and sometimes he's right, most of the time he's right, but sometimes he's wrong. And that makes it really scary for us. So I just wanted to let you guys know what we're doing and that many people cross that road right there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. You did a fine job. Would you like a pen or did you already get one? I already got one. Okay, great job. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Bob Smith, followed by Claire Weatherly. That's a tough group to follow. 
First, I'd like to thank everybody here who have, over the last few years, attended many of the Veterans Day ceremonies and the Memorial Day ceremony. Uh, as chairman of the Greater Falls Church Veterans Council, I'm just so happy that this council has seen to it that our veterans are taken care of in this community and that you've all been very supportive. Having said that, we've got a picnic coming up this Sunday at Cherry Hill Park from noon to 4. Please show up for that and get free food. Come on. And uh, other than that, we have the ceremony coming up this November 11th. This year, it's a special ceremony because it is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And so I have provided a picture of a plaque that we're intending to place on the city hall, on the uh, Parks and Recreation building up front which would then honor those soldiers that died uh, from Falls Church uh, in World War I. There's five names that go on that list. That's the proof I got back today, but I've got to add the date of April of 2017 uh, and uh, November of uh, 28, I mean 1918 on it. And uh, that'll be the correction, and then we'll have that. We'll put it on display during the ceremony, and later we'll mount it on the wall but I just wanted to uh, share this with everyone that this is what we're doing as a council. And then of course, we're still trying to place a monument and, and uh, Wyatt Shield and his staff has uh, worked hard to get something going on that. Uh, there's a lot of little technicalities that we have to work out. It's, it's taking a little longer than what we had hoped for, but uh, I've, I'm, I'm confident that the uh, support of this council will continue to see that we keep moving in that direction to have that uh, monument and thank you very much you any very questions much. thank you very much and thank you for your support of veterans our next speaker is claire weatherly followed by rose weatherly welcome hi um i'm claire weatherly and i live at 525 great falls street um i'm I've noticed three problems in my neighborhood and at my bus stop. The first one is drivers swerve towards the sidewalk in the morning to make a second lane when people are waiting to turn left onto Lincoln and they get too close to the curb and it makes me feel unsafe. The second is cars don't slow down or stop at the crosswalk when people are waiting to cross in the morning and afternoon. And the third is it's hard to cross Lincoln Avenue at Great Falls Street. Um, when I was walking to the library, I saw a car slow down but not stop at the red light at Lincoln. They were only looking at the Great Falls Street traffic and not looking at for pedestrians. The driver clipped the curb and popped his wheel. He came over the curb right near a fifth grader who was standing in her front yard. Um, I hope City Council will work to make my neighborhood and bus stop safer. Some ideas are putting a pedestrian cross signal in to make it easier to cross at Lincoln and Great Falls. And the second is putting a speed bump under the crosswalk across Great Falls Street to Lincoln Park because if you put it before the crosswalk, sometimes people slow down for the speed bump and then go fast right after as they go over it. But if you put it under the crosswalk, then it's guaranteed they'll slow down. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you wrote us a couple of years ago, didn't you? Help us get a crosswalk uh, somewhere. So good work. Um, our last speaker is Rose Weatherly. Welcome. I like your hat. It's sharp. Hi, my name is Rose Weatherly, and I'm a fourth grader at Thomas Jefferson Elementary. I live at 525 Great Falls Street, and my bus stop is at Lincoln Park. This year, I'm one of the older kids at our bus stop. When I was younger, I played at at the park and on the blacktop before the bus came. Now I usually stand and talk with my sister, mom, and, her, and my friend, so some younger kids can have a chance to use a blacktop in the playground. This year I've noticed two things while standing on the sidewalk near Great Falls Street. One, cars go really fast past our bus stop and don't notice the pedestrians in the crosswalk. Two, some cars swerve toward us to make a second lane and try to go faster so they can get to a red light or go to summer a little faster. This makes me feel a little uncomfortable because I, have because I have to watch cars more than usual. I'd like City Council to help think of ways to make our bus stop safer by slowing down traffic. Thank you for all you've done so far. Thank you. Very fine job. 
Um, do we have anyone else who wants to speak at this time? That's the last speaker slip I have. Um, if not, we'll go ahead and turn it over maybe to Mr. Shields to see uh, what say you to uh, what we've just heard from a lot of concerned kids and parents right. about that intersection and that area in general. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor Tarter. And, and first, uh, let me say that I've got a lot of empathy for what you're telling us. Uh, this is serious. And, um, you know, from, a, from the perspective of the city employees, a lot of us work on the street every day, uh, all day long. And so we know what you're talking about. We experience it. Um, just as an anecdote, while we were putting, well, while our public works folks were putting the orange sign out there this morning with the with the speed sensor on it, the staff who had all the reflective gear on were crossing that ped crossing, and they experienced exactly what you're describing. Uh, people honked their horn at them. Uh, people sped up at them. Uh, people swerved around to get around them. It is, uh, it, you know, it's but it is something that that. Uh, just in, uh, while I was there watching them do that, I got a, a very quick taste of what it is that you're speaking of. Um, so what we will do is we'll, we'll uh, take these comments. I will talk with Public Works, and we'll, we'll need a, uh, a point of contact I think might be most useful or, or a listserv with the neighborhood so we can communicate what can be done uh, in terms of short-term solutions. Then we do have, um, for things that really involve the redesign of the street or changing the intersection, uh, we do have a, a, a process where we have more engineering and, and more design, and we like to do that in collaboration with the neighborhood. Um, and so that's a process uh, that is a bit more involved, um, and we call it the Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program, and I think probably a lot of you are familiar with that. Uh, so we can follow up with you to describe that process as well. Um, as the mayor noted at the, at the beginning, it is um, it has been a, a priority for the city council to make the city more walkable. And I think probably our, our main desire, if we could redesign every street in the city <laughs> right now, I think a lot of these design standards uh, were just for a different era, and uh, we want to be safer for, for everybody who's on the street, uh, not just the cars. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. Um, so. Uh, let us follow up with you and discuss what can be done in the short term and then the process for making kind of uh, for considering the engineering and working through in a collaborative way changes to the to the configuration of the street as something that is a little bit daunting for the neighborhood traffic calming program we have 19 projects that are currently going through the process uh, there are seven uh, that the citizens advisory commission on transportation has ranked as uh, should uh, should advance to the design phase and two of those are in design right now one of those is on Great Falls Street and that's a project that came through this process um, at Great Falls and Little Falls Street um, and so we can talk with you about what design solutions were explored there and, and, and how the decisions were made and see what we can then apply uh, further up Great Falls Street okay I wonder just following up on what a few folks had said or asked about um, one, I wonder if you could just consider the idea of maybe having the police come out mm -hmm. for, you know, a period of time, a few days or various times of the day, just so folks um, can get the idea that maybe there's somebody watching over them. I don't know, just something to maybe talk to the chief about. And also the sign as well, the no, no turn when pedestrians are present, seemed like a fairly uh, quick fix as well. In other words, no right turn on red when pedestrians mm -hmm. are present. I don't believe there's such a sign there now, but... Um, and I think also just give some consideration to maybe being able to give them a time in which you might be getting back to them so that maybe we could ask for either a council update or a council and community update maybe in, you know, one month's time or something like that. Do you have an idea when you might be able to follow up with folks so they have an Well, we can follow up this week, uh, but in terms of um, actions, then I think, you know, we'll just need to follow up depending on what those actions are, what the timeline for those would be. And we can communicate with you directly on that, and, and I'll give a report to the city council on that. Okay. Okay, so we have a couple comments. Uh, Vice Mayor Connolly, then Mr. Z. Um, I just want to thank the neighbors for coming forward with this. We always find that the people that use the intersections and streets the most are the experts on exactly what is going on there. So thanks for sharing all your experiences. Um, ben had mentioned the bushes too, Mr. Shields, and people occasionally mention bushes as a problem, and sometimes those bushes are on private property. How does the city handle that? If the bushes are on private property and yeah. And how do you so the, the bushes that we were looking at this morning, and I'm not sure if we're talking about the exact same ones, but if you're heading 
um, away from Lincoln on Great Falls, the bushes that are on the right side of the street right before Dorchester, um, city staff are going to trim those back directly just because that's a, an immediate issue that needs to be addressed. We typically do, uh, for sh quieter streets or for less urgent situations, we, we do need the property owners to take care of the, the bushes, but sometimes that takes them a while to do that. Uh, in this instance, the city's going to go back and trim those bushes back. Mr. Z? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, uh, this list of projects was uh, passed to us while we were uh, listening to the public's comments, and, and I noticed that uh, uh, if, you, if you read beyond the listing of, of what's here, that uh, three of the projects of the 19 or, um, you know, a fairly significant number uh, uh, indicate uh, something beyond <coughs> Some of the others that uh, have no status uh, need petition to be returned. Uh, um, these all say active need data. I um, don't know what the data is, but I do know that uh, from <coughs> leaving on Pennsylvania where I uh, uh, chose not to become involved just to see uh, what how long it would take to get something done on Pennsylvania Avenue that it took a enormous amount of time to get anything done and uh, it wasn't until the neighbors got really, really excited um, that uh, we saw action uh, take place and uh, tonight uh, I think the neighbors are sufficiently excited. Um, I don't know that a uh, simple will meet with you and decide what can be done is, is a proper answer, quite frankly, city manager. Uh, I mean, these things just don't seem to be that difficult. Maintain a visual line of sight, trim some bushes, Mark the pedestrian crossing, consider lights, enforcement signage. This should not require a two-year engineering study that costs the city $50,000 to get these things done. I am sick and tired of spending taxpayer money on things that don't have a result. Let's get some results here, and I want to report back before the end of the year. And better yet, if we can get, get some results, physical things done, by then that would be even better. Thank you. All right, other, Mr. Lickenhouse. <clears throat> thank you. So I do want to thank the neighbors for coming out, um, especially the kids for showing up. I mean, it, it does make a difference. And Rose, I've seen your tenacity on the lacrosse field, and uh, it certainly carries over to public speaking as well. So thank you guys for coming in. Um, to further to some of the points that were made earlier, um, you know, I've experienced firsthand how quickly we can put signs up. Uh, I had someone that we caught on security camera in the front of our house, hop a curve, plow over a, um, a school crossing sign in our front yard, and it was replaced in 24 hours. Uh, and that wasn't even making a call as a city council member. It was making a call to the police. So I know that we can put some signs up. Uh, I know that there's studies and things that have to be checked down. But at least the simple things until we get through the traffic engineering uh, and some of the things that have been asked for for year end, uh, at the very least, some of those signs I think we can put up quickly. Um, but the larger point is, and, and to some of the points made here earlier related to appropriation of funds, um, I would personally like to know, based on the uh, traffic calming uh, list that you provided us here, as well as some of the things that have been asked for tonight, um, how much money do we have uh, that's left for some of those traffic calming measures? Do we need an additional appropriation? I mean, we just sat here a couple weeks ago and talked about some surpluses related to, um, to fiscal year. And if there's money that we need to appropriate to get some of this stuff done, I would certainly like to know what that is um, because I know that these signs aren't that expensive. And so if there are things that we can get done immediately, uh, if it's a funding issue, uh, I want to make sure that we address that as quickly as possible because this is obviously a priority because uh, the kids' safety. So um, thank you. I would just respond quickly. The, the things that are in the realm of paint and trimming bushes and that type of putting up signs, those are operating budgets, so that's just work we do. The, the actual appropriation for the neighborhood traffic calming program is $200,000 per year, and the last year's budget is the first time that the council had that as a recurring um, uh, appropriation that's built in now to the, to the budget process. Uh, we were using grants or sort of one-time money in the past. Um, so that's the level of funding for the neighborhood traffic calming program. That's for changing curbs, putting in hard solutions, not paint or sort of things that are, are more administrative. So, so to that point, if there are additional funds that are needed for something that is a more permanent solution, I'd like to know what that is as well. 
I mean, if it's beyond the 200,000, if we've got the... Well, there's an infinite need. I mean, oh. <laughs> we, we could, as noted earlier, we could redesign everything. In terms of the things that we've talked about here, in terms of the things that are on this list, that's what I'd like to know. Okay. All right. So just to chime in on that, um, well, thank you also for the neighbors for coming out, especially the kids who are staying past bedtime to come speak to us. Um, to make a more pointed request, um, as it relates to the budget discussion for FY20, so given the 200000 we have for NTC, I think our track record is that we're able to get two of these hard projects done each year with that budget. Um, this list is only growing, and I imagine if we actually had the neighborhoods from each of these come out, they would have very similar stories. So I'd like to better understand, do we need to up that budget um, as it relates to the budget discussions that we'll have in a few months? Um, how many we think we're going to get through in the next year or so? Because um, I imagine that, again, many people are going to have a sim some of these similar concerns, and I think you certainly have appetite and desire by the council to actually see more action than what the progress we're making to date. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Oh, um, thanks. So... Um, I certainly support the other comments that council members have made about looking at this intersection and looking at increased appropriations in the next budget and even looking at as we clear Lear at year end <coughs> last year if we have funds available I think we ought to think about allocating more to the neighborhood traffic calming program um, unfortunately traffic is a little bit like water you compress it here and it comes out there so even as we address particular circumstances like this one, and I think they, they clearly deserve it. I think we also need to look at a more systematic approach. We're not going to stop the traffic, but I'm wondering if we can, even as we address particular intersections, and there are loads of them around the city, and clearly this is one of them that needs to be addressed expeditiously, is there a is there something more systematically we ought to do for example at the entrances of each of the city is there each entrance to the city is there something we can put up is there some additional um, state legislation that we haven't used um, so these would be the questions that I'd like us to see uh, go forward with um, specifically clearly looking at this particular intersection and set of facts I think we also need to work with the schools to see where they're locating their bus stops. Are these really under current traffic conditions the best place to have them? And that's not a necessarily purely a city determination, but it does involve um, it does involve the schools. So I would add those additional components to what you've heard other council members uh, say, and I'm certainly available to work with you on any of these. So thank you. All right, thank you all for coming out and uh, look forward to continuing this, this discussion with you all. Um, our next item is council requests. Are there any council requests at this time? All right, let's move on. Oh, Ms. Hardy. Um, so while we're on the topic of pedestrian safety, not to belabor the point, but I started actually, while we, knowing that we were talking about this at length, um, started collecting kind of other public works, traffic calming related things, and I want to see whether in the next work session we get a more comprehensive update. So a few of the things that were on my list, and there's probably more than that, um, Annandale and Winter Hill. So I remember last year, most of us actually went and visited that bus stop, and we got the flashing stop sign um, at the corner of Gundry and Annandale, and I think we talked about other kind of near-term things that we could do to help with the speeding along Annandale, since that street is very wide and really meant to build, built for kind of much faster cars. So I'd love an update on where we are at that. Um, I think um, Vice Mayor Connolly asked about the Lee Street intersection and getting ped heads installed at all four corners, which I think originally we discussed the Kensington project was going to pay for one of them, and we thought we might use city funds for the other ones. Um, we've talked about the one at um, Maple and Broad, um, so that signal I think was always broken. For a while it was actually showing a white um, ped walk signal, but actually it was not, and so people were actually crossing when they weren't supposed to, so I think there was plans I think in the CIP to replace that. Um, we've talked about the one at um, Annandale and Hillwood, which I think we are going to talk about in the budget amendment. Um, there was another request about no parking next to Clay Cafe because there's a little small strip where people end up parking sometimes. Anyway, I've got a really long list of other things, but I want to see whether we can get a more comprehensive update on these kind of walkability, pedestrian safety concerns I think we've collected over the past year or so and maybe a good session um, and work session instead of doing it now. Thank right. you. Vice Mayor, uh, why, then we'll go to you, Ross. Along the same lines, Mr. Shields, the ones that Ms. Hardy just mentioned don't really fit into neighborhood traffic calming. That's part of the problem. They're, they're commuter routes, and so the neighborhood traffic calming doesn't cover those. So, And we don't actually have a program that covers them, right? They're just 
we handle them as needed. And so I'm wondering, do we need to look at them holistically and think about all those intersections? Because if we are going to improve walkability, that should be the next step. Um, so I would agree with you on that one. And then my second request is just related to budgets. Um, uh, you had sent us an email earlier this week with the breakdown of how much has been spent on the high school project. I, could you do a similar thing with the EDA spending on the pocket park? I'd be interested to know how much has been spent so far on that project as the EDA has explored it, got, has some work done by contractors, and now at this point they're changing direction. Thank you. Mr. Lichtenhaus. Thank you. Um, I've had some correspondence with um, some of the citizens out there in the community related to, and this is another um, traffic issue, related to the left turn from Haycock into George Mason High School. I believe there's a hashed box there, a uh, painted box. Um, there's concern about traffic blocking the box, making it difficult for people to cross from Haycock into George Mason High School uh, at the risk of being hit by folks going in the right lane closest to George Mason High School. So we need to add that to the list. Um, some of the recommendations that have been made, uh, simple, don't block the box with some flashing lights, maybe not flashing lights, but at least to have people stop blocking the intersection from turning into Haycock to George Mason High School. Um, so I'd like that to, uh, to be looked at as well and hopefully a simple solution. So again, not necessarily considered neighborhood traffic calming, but um, the traffic issue as well. I have another council request. Uh, maybe this can wait till later. Um, City Manager, I did want to talk about an update to the Broad and Washington project in light of some recent news uh, and getting an update from the developers to, to show up here to, to talk about um, um, uh, the recent uh, legal issues with, um, with Todd Hitt on that project. If that's something that we're going to discuss later, I can leave it to there. Otherwise, I have a specific request to that. Are we going to talk about that later? Um, I'd be happy to. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other requests? If not, uh, Mr. Shields, your report. Uh, well, thank you, um, Mayor Tarter, members of council. And I will just start with the uh, point that Mr. Lickenhouse raised there at the end. Um, with the uh, charges that were brought this past Friday against uh, Todd Hitt, we have gotten questions about what that means to the Washington and Broad Project uh, specifically. Um, as the council is, is aware and will recall, uh, Todd Hitt's company, KIDAR, uh, was going to be an occupant of the office building, and uh, Todd Hitt himself was represented to us as, as one of the partners in that project. Um, we have had conversation with Insight Development um, on the status of Washington Abroad uh, since those charges were filed, and um, and what is represented to us, what I can share uh, with the council and with the community is that uh, what Insight has indicated is that they have from the beginning been the controlling partner for the Washington Broad Project. Um, so in terms of the uh, governance of that project from, uh, from, a, uh, from a corporate perspective, um, there is no change. Uh, they are still um, intending to proceed with the project. Um, they do have um, an issue that Insight needs to solve in terms of the tenancy of the proposed office building, um, but that is uh, something for Insight to solve. They may want to have a conversation with the council about that uh, as part of their briefing, but um, and that could be a question just in terms of, of uh, their progress. Um, they have uh, indicated they'd be willing to come to the council if, uh, if uh, requested just to provide an overall update on the project. Uh, one thing I would just note for the public in terms of understanding of, of how we work with developers, um, what the city's role is in any development project is as a regulator. Uh, we're not an equity investor. We're not a partner uh, to a development uh, program such as Washington and Broad. Uh, what we're our role is, is to consider it from a land use perspective under the city's zoning powers. Um, now, having said that, there are obviously a great deal of negotiations that happen with developers uh, through voluntary concessions and, and other commitments that the developer makes to the city. Um, and so when something like this, which is a, essentially a breach of trust uh, in terms of one of the partners of that project, that is of, of great concern to the city. Um, and so we'll want to uh, 
you know, continue the air dialogue with Insight just to understand what the implications are uh, for that project. And, and um, w what I've relayed tonight is what we understand as of now. So I would just, to go back on my formal request, I would just formally request that some representation from the Insight development team come to council, either a work session or council session, something. <coughs> so one, they can present further on how that potentially changes the timing of the deal. And I know that they're committed to getting it done. Um, also, how that potentially changes just the, uh, the overall partnership for them and how that affects timing, but also to give us an opportunity to ask more questions. So I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they'd be willing to come speak to us, but I think that we owe that to council and to the public to, to be able to have that conversation here from them and be able to ask questions related to that project. Yeah. So Ms. Hardy and then Vice Mayor Connolly. Thank you. Um, I'll agree with Mr. Lickness. I think having them here would be great. Um, Mr. Shields, are you able to comment on um, the impact to any other projects or ownership of buildings in the city? Well, um, so in terms of hit construction proper, um, the city has two areas of interest. One is we have a contract with hit construction for the city hall project. Uh, secondly, the city is currently evaluating a proposal from Rushmark, who is partnered with hit construction for the West Falls Church 10-acre uh, uh, development project at the high school campus. Um, what has been represented to us um, is that Todd Hitt has had n has no uh, ownership stake in Hit Construction and is not an employee of Hit Construction. And in our work on those both of those projects, there has been no interaction with Todd Hitt on either of those. Um, so I, that's uh, what I can relay to uh, uh, to the council and to the public on those other two projects. Vice Mayor Connolly. Uh, Mr. Shields, what about the Stratford Motor Lodge? Is that part of the Kidder Capital portfolio or Todd Hitt's? Well, um, it is represented to us that Todd Hitt has had a controlling interest in that property for maybe two years now. Um, and um, so that, that's the knowledge that I have of that. I'm, I'm not aware of any other properties in which there is an interest uh, by Todd Hitt. Mr. Snyder? I would uh, just ask, in addition to what's been mentioned, if the city attorney could take a look at the entire range and scope of any potential relationship between the city and those mentioned to give us advice and to make that public. So I will do that. All right. Um, if there's nothing else for Mr. Shields, why don't Vice Mayor Connolly, sure. One of the co written comments came from Bridget Kraft, who lives near that intersection of Lincoln and Great Falls, talking about the construction around her house and um, her concerns about lack of notification of the citizens. And I'm just wondering if has anyone on staff talked to her, addressed those concerns? Um, well, we have been in, in touch with uh, Ms. Kraft and the neighbors. Um, in terms of that project specifically, a letter was mailed to all of the residents near that project. Um, that's our normal way of notice. Um, and for some of the projects, uh, property owners that were immediately adjacent, we also uh, you know, knocked on the door. I don't know that that happened with Ms. Kraft in addition to the letter. Um, since then, uh, we have had a, a great deal of interaction um, and, and we're working to resolve um, a, a concern relating to flooding that occurred um, and uh, so that, that work is ongoing. In terms of the status of the Dorchester uh, sewer line uh, project as a whole, uh, the contractor has until February to complete that project. Um, we are working with the, the contractor. The work is sort of moving downstream towards the fire station. Um, and uh, we're working to see if we can relocate some of the staging. Um, a, it makes sense for the direction the project is going, but two, uh, to provide some relief to the Pennsylvania Avenue neighbors who have been uh, dealing with noise and disturbance from that project for a couple of months now. So my request is, she had some good ideas just about better ways to notify citizens or to keep them updated about what was going on the projects, things that would have made it less painful to her and her nearby neighbors. And I'm just wondering if 
staff who was working on that project could be in touch with her just to figure out you know some lessons learned on how we could do this sure. better since we're going to be doing these kind of projects absolutely um she had some very good thoughts right thanks and and uh we're working right now on the i'm shifting topics now but we're working right now on the construction management plan for founders row and that's a project that will obviously have major impacts on the surrounding neighborhood in the voluntary concessions there is an obligation by the developer to have regular contact with the, with the neighborhood and to have a monthly meeting with the neighborhood on status reports uh, and projects but that's going to be a you know a, a, a three-year construction project um, and that is clearly necessary in, in that case mr. Z well thank you mayor I uh, <coughs> I live close to Bridget Craft and, and John Ward, and, and uh, uh, I, I want to thank uh, them for their patience and, and uh, their forbearance and um, their great sense of humor um, in the face with this. And, and also want to thank the city in, in working with them to, to uh, try to address the results of the flooding that occurred uh, that uh, flooded out their, uh, I think it was their Prius. Water in an electric car is never pretty. Um, but to the, uh, to the city's effort, I, I have to say that uh, um, um, when I walk my dog in the morning, I notice that when they need to run the crawlers, that they uh, don't begin right at the crack seven, which they are per permitted to do. They generally wait until 7.30, quarter of eight. So I think they're trying to be sensitive to the na needs of the neighborhood. Uh, so I do want to thank them for that. The, the only thing I want to remind the city to do is, is uh, maybe get uh, um, Robert Goff to swing by there um, at times because uh, there was a period of time when people were ignoring the do not enter signs and then uh, he put up all kinds of barriers and made them put double and triple signs. Now, as time goes by, they're being a little bit lazy about that. I'm noticing, uh, well, I hate, hesitate to call them scoff laws uh, because maybe they can't see the signs of the barriers, uh, but uh, if we can uh, have Robert um, make it more pronounced so that these scoff laws actually know that they're breaking the law, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, just looking at our packet, uh, I wonder if uh, staff could respond to Jerry Barrett's letter uh, regarding the uh, multi-unit trash and recycling removal policy that the city maintains. Um, I think we all know that <clears throat> the Park Towers is not being singled out in any way, uh, but I'm not sure that I've ever read a succinct explanation that uh, would tell somebody, um, you know, in a multi-unit building what the story is. Um, he draws a distinction between a completely residential building, which Park Towers is, and I presume a mixed-use building, but I'm not sure we treat any of those differently but at any rate if yeah. you could just you know have something written down and delivered in request in response to the request that uh, a response to their petition be provided um, I will certainly do that I have spoken with mr. Barrett about this and I have promised him a written response and um, and, and we will do that as a as a policy across the city multifamily or mixed-use development handles their own solid waste and and essentially any project that has gone through a site plan probably since the 1960s uh, that is the arrangement um, uh, but we will uh, get back with mr. Barrett in a more formal way mm -hmm. mr. Snyder so thanks a lot um, a couple additional things following up on that um, maybe we could offer some coordinated sort of purchasing arrangement that might reduce costs at the very least for those those um, multifamily uh, if, if we're not for whatever reason going to go all the way to provide it at city expense is there some sort of coordination we can do to, uh, to assist with that I want to go back to the traffic calming um, so um, a, 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 a couple things it seems to me that um, this, this is a problem that crops up at al almost every intersection in the city at this point, and they're all important, they're all critical. Um, so 
Um, um, I, I do think we need to address these issues as they come up. And I want to thank city staff for, for doing the best that they can. But if we need additional resources behind this, I think we ought to, we ought to confront that. Um, and I would also, uh, and I'll work with Cindy on this, are there some of these regional transportation monies that we can reallocate for this kind of a project or go after them that we're not? So that's Please something that we can talk about. Doing. Um, in the future to see if we can't bundle these together in some sort of a project that would, uh, that would qualify. Um, I do think there's an issue of the city regaining a reputation as no place to go to speed. At one point we had that reputation, I think, many years ago. Uh, maybe it was the Volvo police cars, but whatever it was, it was an image that you don't come into Falls Church and drive too fast. Now, I realize that there's been a pretty consistent breakdown in, in driving behavior all across the country and certainly in our region. So we can't cure all of that. But I, I would be interested in not only looking at the resource issue, looking at how we can get these minor fixes out more quickly, how we get additional um, uh, funding perhaps for some regional sources, but also is there a more systematic approach we can take um, as well. So. Um, willing to work and commit um, the additional time uh, to that. So thanks much. All right, Ms. Hardy. Sorry, I'm going to try to beat this horse some more um, while we're talking about kind of money for pedestrian safety. So uh, I really appreciate Mr. Snyder's comments around thinking creatively. So one area that we actually might have money already is around the Park Avenue Great Streets project. So we've been talking about, I think the EDA um, recommended approval of those Park Avenue improvements. And I know that we actually talked about um, being able to complete a sidewalk that's been orphaned on, um, I think, the corner of Virginia and Park. And so given that we have budget for it, this seems like a great place to kind of improve pedestrian safety, given the sidewalk really dead ends right before you get to North Virginia. Um, and I think in the past, we've actually had people come out and speak to us that before because it's also a, a bus stop for kids. People have had to kind of run across the intersection to get the other side of Park when they realize um, that the sidewalk ends. So if that's something that we can actually you know, strike while the iron's hot, given there's a proposed house on the corner of Virginia and Park, I don't want to miss that window where we could potentially add it while that house is going to get torn down and, and, and be rebuilt. So if that's an opportunity for us to actually extend the sidewalk, given that we have money for the Great Streets project, we have a house that's going to be under construction and owners that are willing to make it happen. Um, I know it's been long talked about trying to extend that sidewalk on the north side of Park Avenue um, and connect it to Cherry Hill. That'd be a great thing to do um, in the immediate future if we can. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, why don't we go to the first item on the agenda, Madam Clerk? Yes, we have TO 18-10, Ordinance to Amend Ordinance 1983 and Ordinance 1984 uh, regarding the budget of expenditures and revenues, appropriating funds for fiscal year 2019 for the General Fund, Cable Access Fund, and the Capital Improvement, uh, Improvements Program funds. All right, thank you very much. Before we get to staff, I would like to read a um, short disclosure statement. After consulting with the city attorney, I want to make the following statement before city council's consideration of a budget amendment. Agenda item 10B1 regarding TO 18-10. My wife is an employee of the Falls Church City School Board, and therefore I'm a member of a group of three or more persons that may be affected by the FY 2019 budget. However, I can participate in this matter fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. Vice Mayor Connolly. After consulting with the city attorney, I want to make the following statement before city council's consideration of a budget amendment. Agenda item 10B1, first reading of 1018, TO 18-10. I am an employee of the Falls Church City School Board and therefore I'm a member of a group of three or more persons that may be affected by the FY 2019 budget. I can participate in this matter fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. All right, Mr. Shields. Thank you, members of council um, and mayor. So uh, the budget amendment was discussed at work session, and I'll just summarize it sort of at the top line and um, be happy to answer any questions. Um, Ms. Bawa is under the weather, and uh, so I will try to handle the staff report. Uh, so from the general fund, what the budget uh, amendment uh, would appropriate $388,357 entirely from new grants or donations that were received from the city since the fiscal year started. Um, and in addition to that, $303,171 would be funded through the use of fund balance. Um, of that amount, $75,000 is from savings from the last year that would be matched with insurance proceeds to replace 
the traffic signal at Hillwood. $100,000 would be appropriate from the school campus uh, capital line item uh, for the planning for the West Falls Church Eco Economic Development portion of that project, and $128,171 using uh, PEG fees uh, to uh, build out the uh, equipment that's needed in the new city hall for uh, filming and uh, broadcasting uh, public meetings uh, and, and also putting new uh, monitors there for the public um, in the council chambers. Uh, in the capital improvements program, uh, the uh, budget is the budget amendment is for three million eight hundred two thousand four hundred sixty four dollars. Um, of that is $100,000 for the campus project, which I mentioned just a moment ago. And then $3.7 million uh, is, from the special is to the Special Transportation Fund, and that is entirely grant-funded. Um, and that includes uh, $254,000 uh, for uh, NVTA funds for WMATA, um, $95,000 uh, of smart scale grants uh, for the downtown um, opportunity area and three million two hundred forty four thousand nine hundred fifty nine dollars uh, for the WNOD trail which is a pass-through grant uh, that will be uh, passed through the City of Falls Church but it would be administered by the Northern Virginia uh, Parks Authority. Uh, so that's a quick summary of the the main items in this uh, budget amendment. I happy, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Mr. Z. Thank you, Mayor. The, um, there's a lot to like here. For example, uh, uh, with your dispassionate approach on, on describing the special transportation fund, $3.7 million, that fully 3.24 of that is for the appropriation of a grant that we received to uh, do a dual lane Washington OD trail to replace existing. Uh, bike trail, I think that's very exciting for the city. It's something we've been looking forward to. We've trialed it out in public, and of course, since Falls Church was where they first begun to build the WNOD trail, it's completely appropriate that uh, any improvements uh, begin here as well. Uh, I do have a question for you that with regard to the increase in uh, funds, specifically the CIP <coughs> funds for the uh, um, redevelopment at West Falls Church. Uh, these are characterized as uh, prospective costs for legal and consulting fees to ensure the best outcome. Uh, I don't have a problem with the language. I just uh, want to ask you whether, in fact, uh, will this do the trick for this go around, or are we looking at uh, more downstream? Well, um, this uh, of that 100,000, approximately uh, 65,000 of that is already, we know how that's going to be spent. Uh, it'll be spent for the soil and geotech borings that have already been done. We anticipate that we probably will be, we anticipate will be reimbursed for that work. And the remainder is for uh, uh, legal fees. It is possible, uh, Council Member Z, that um, in May there would be a final uh, request for funding, um, but we're working. We're we're doing everything we can to make to keep our costs under control uh, for that. Well, thank you very much. I know that uh, um, the city has been a, a great steward of the taxpayers' funds with regard to this uh, generational project. So I would expect uh, uh, no less that you continue that fine work. And uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, Mr. Lichtenhouse. Mr. Lichtenhouse. Mm. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so going to, to some of the costs associated with the uh, with the West End project, um, which costs? Because I think you provided an itemized list here. Which one of these costs do we expect to be reimbursable or recouped? I should say. You mentioned the boring. Yeah, that's the actually the one cost that we anticipate will be reimbursed. And, and I, if I recall, that's about uh, twenty thousand dollars for those borings. Is it twenty thousand? Thirty thousand eight. Yeah, yeah thirty thousand. Oh, thirty one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's because Gilbane's doing that work and effectively doing that. Yeah, that would typically be done project. by the purchaser. Mm -hmm. um, because we have asked for a, a relatively short due diligence period, and we also, because we didn't want to do the borings during the time when students are at the school, we had them done over the summer. 
in advance, and uh, uh, the developer, the, the selected developer, will reimburse us for that. Okay, so we have to pay Gilbain, who's doing the construction of the high school, and then the developer selected for the economic development piece reimburses us. That's correct. Okay, a couple of the other the cost. I mean, I, I question whether or not these are potentially recoverable as well. I mean, we've got traffic impact study. Um, we've also got some sanitary sewer surveys. Uh, I understand that some of that stuff has to be in, done in advance uh, from a due diligence perspective on our end. However, you know, I'm looking at where some of these costs are going, and you know, I look at I look at Slade for the traffic impact study, and that's a, that's a group that's on both teams of the 10 acre site. We expect that we could get that recouped, depending on who's selected. I mean, I look at opportunities here where some of the work that we're doing is to advance a project that somebody's ultimately going to be on. So I would hope that that could be recoverable as well. It's a point well taken. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up with you on that or okay. follow up to discuss that further. Okay. And I would say the same for, for Dewberry as well because I know that they're on the um, the Rushmark team, depending on who gets selected. So I, I would like to see if those are things that we could recover as part of advancing this project um, for someone that's selected, assuming that we're going to be working with someone that we've already paid to do some of the work to advance that portion. I think it's something we can negotiate. Other comments? Someone open up to the public. Um, does either of the two members of the public here <coughs> wish to speak to this matter? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Um, are there any additional questions or comments, or does someone want to make a motion? Mayor, I move to grant first reading for TO 18-10, schedule second reading and public hearing for October 22nd, 2018, and advertise the same, same according to law. We have a second. Second. Vice Mayor Connolly on the second. Madam Clerk. Ms. Connolly? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Mr. Snyder? No. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tartar? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. The next item. We have uh, TO 18-11, an ordinance to amend the official zoning district uh, map of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, by rezoning a total of approximately 34.6527 acres of land from R1A low density residential to B2 central business for the properties at 7124 Leesburg Pike, real property code numbers 51-221-001, 52-221-002, and 51-221-003 on application by the City of Falls Church and the School Board of the City of Falls Church. Thank you very much, Ms. Aubrey. Welcome. Good evening, Council. Carly Aubrey is planning staff. Um, I'll give a very brief presentation. Um, I was here last week with the work session. As you'll recall, the site was brought into the city as part of the 2013 boundary adjustment agreement. And as required by the city zoning ordinance, it is zoned R1A until otherwise classified. So the request of tonight's ordinance is to provide a suitable zoning district designation for the future of the land to reflect plans for it, the new high school and to signal the city's intention to support mixed use development. Um, this is the next step in the series of land use actions that the city has taken. In January of this year, the city council adopted a resolution amending the um, chapter four, the land use or comprehensive plan, and then also the future land use map to provide text for special revitalization district for education and economic development and to place designations of park and open space with two school symbols and mixed use within a special revitalization district on the future land use map for the subject site. In August of this year, the city council adopted an ordinance amending the text of the B2 district in the zoning ordinance to allow elementary and secondary schools up to seven stories to be built by right in areas designated as a special revitalization district and then also added new special exception provisions for lands that are within those districts and also designated mixed use on the future land use map. And these zoning, this zoning map amendment would apply these zoning, these amended B2 zoning rules to the subject site. So in yeah, I can't talk. In conclusion, staff recommends the zoning map amendment because it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and future land use map 
and would accommodate the anticipated developments on the site. And it also supports um, rezoning, including the trends of growth and change and encouragement of the most appropriate use of land throughout the locality. Um, an update to the schedule. The second hearing is set for December 10th. And then it'll go out to Planning Commission, Economic Development Authority, and the School Board within that time. And I can take any questions. Thank you very much. We have a question, Vice Mayor Connolly. Thanks for this, Ms. Albury. Will this also go out to Fairfax County as our neighbors surrounding the site? They will receive, by state code, they will get a formal notice from us. And then we all, we are also having um, communication with staff, um, planning staff, and then also the two adjacent Board of Supervisors. Other questions? Mr. Duncan. Um, I hope this is within the scope of this item, but uh, I received an email from someone uh, a couple of days ago uh, who asked if the I-66 inside the Beltway project is going to impinge on this land that we're discussing here now, basically the school portion especially, but even maybe some of the 10 acres dedicated for economic development, particularly the school portion, though. Is, mm -hmm. is there? I, I was not aware, except for the flyover bridge that's coming from exit 66 into the West Falls Church Loop Road. Is any of the I-66 inside the Beltway work going to cut into our lands? No, not not my understanding. Uh, to yeah. confirm, it's the, this part would be the ramp that they're taking off I-66 into West Falls Church Metro more directly instead of 7 to Haycock, mm -hmm. and it's totally within VDOT's own right-of-way. It does not touch right, city owned That's land. my understanding. It's totally within their right-of-way, right. not impinging on our lands. And right. planning staff has been working closely with VDOT on that to make sure it actually is an asset to this redevelopment and right. doesn't have a negative impact in terms of access as well. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. I just wanted to get back to this individual who had heard something from somebody who, you know, purported to know something about what was going on at VDOT. So thanks. All right. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to open it up to the public. Um, if there's any member of the public who wishes to speak to this matter, um, you're welcome to do so. Seeing none, uh, the matter is closed to the public. So are there any additional comments or questions before I move to a motion? No, do we have a motion? I move to adopt, move to grant first reading for TO 18-11, refer to the Planning Commission, School Board, and Economic Development Authority for comments, schedule second reading and public hearing for December 10th, 2018, and advertise the same according to law. Do we have a second? Second. Madam Clerk. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhaus? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. And Mayor Tartar? Yes. Motion carries 7 to 0. Thank you. All right. Let's move to the consent agenda. Is there any council member that wishes to remove any item from the consent agenda? All right. Mr. Shields, is there anything to be said about this consent agenda item? Note that the city is a longtime member of the Workforce Investment uh, Board Consortium. And so what this um, consent item d will do is just update our agreement uh, with that consortium. And um, it's, it's part of a very worthwhile regional effort. All right. Do we have a motion regarding the – well, let me ask if there's any public comment as formality. Is there any member of the public that wishes – excuse me? Can I make one? Yes, you can, of course. We do have a city representative – to the Workforce Investment Board. His name is Robert Bartoletta, and he sends updates occasionally to City Council that Ms. Heath shared with us, but a recent back and forth I had with him was that he's recommending that it might be useful to know that the city is part of the WIOA incumbent worker training program that subsidizes training of industry recognized credentials for current employees. And <coughs> he says that if there are employees in the city, I think not city employees, but employees of businesses in the city. He's happy to provide information to that as well so we can take full advantage of this agreement.
there any additional comments? Um, Mayor, I move the consent agenda. All right, do we have a second? Second. Can, Councilman can Hardy we get a, on the second. Oh, can we get a call vote on this just yes, in case will. they need it? Okay. All right, let's do it. <laughs> uh, Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhaus? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. All right, before we get to the last items here, um, Mr. Shields, I think there's been some discussion about a closed session, a brief closed session for an update. Is that, I don't see that on the agenda here, but was that intended? Uh, the, um, it, it is intended, um, Council, I would like to just uh, take the opportunity to, to have, a, I, th I think what can be a brief um, update and, and brief briefing on the uh, West Falls Church project and it would be appropriate for it to be in closed session just to protect the city's negotiating uh, posture and there is a, a motion uh, that's been prepared by the clerk and the city attorney that would allow us to do that all right before we get to that is there any other business that hasn't been discussed tonight any business not in the agenda yes miss hardy sorry one more um council request um i think there was a bridge that vdot's holding on the bike pedestrian bridge over the WNOD in 29 this Thursday. Do we have someone on staff plugged in on the latest on that? No, we are plugged in on that, and uh, we will have a representative there. Um, and I think we're also trying to help publicize that event. But um, I, I can follow up with council on the details. Okay, it'd be great to get an update on where, when that is happening or status or what it looks like. Thanks. Mr. Z. Uh, following up on a... Um, uh, conversation with um, um, assistant uh, manager uh, Mester <clears throat> understand that the uh, city has received proposals been found to be uh, responsive and responsible for the uh, solid waste collection for the renewal uh, that will be uh, <clears throat> for the next five years when adopted and uh, it's been suggested to me by some members of the ESC that might be a good idea that if you could set up a little um, a, a, uh, a work group uh, they could sign NDAs and just uh, review the um, proposals um, small not the entire ESC and um, just go over what it is so that uh, uh, they could provide advice and consent that would might avoid a need for all of us to to do this in full chamber let, uh, um, let me think let me get back with you on that that's a little bit unusual, but uh, we can try to understand what, what it is the interest is in, in the procurement process. There are certainly big public interests in it. Um, in terms of the actual contractual matters, let, let me just follow up with you on that. I'm a little bit call, caught on, off guard by that proposal. But. Well, that is my bunt. Okay. Thank you. All right, anything else uh, before we... Uh, just a couple of calendar questions, uh, since the mayor often wants to know what it is we're doing this weekend. Uh, the, tomorrow <laughs> night, the chamber uh, mini golf uh, event is at 5:30. Looks like the weather's going to be okay at uh, Upton Hill, so come on and have some fun. Is it is it Jefferson, is it Jefferson this year? No. Okay. All right. Uh, really? Uh, on uh, s Friday night, I saw that the boosters are thinking of having a mini tailgate before the football game at 7 o'clock, so 6.30 in case anybody happens to be up to high school, they might want to come and participate in that. And then on Saturday, is Saturday uh, clean up and recycling Saturday? Okay, so that's a Saturday thing. Volunteer Fire Department's having an open house at 10, Fall Carnival from the elementary PTA at 11. And so those are the things that are on my calendar that I thought you might want to know about. And did Bob Smith say the Falls Church Veterans Picnic is Sunday yeah, from noon to 4? Oh, that's a long picnic. Anyway, at Cherry Hill Park. There's also home stretches having something tomorrow night as well. Yeah. Something like 6.30 to 8, 7. Where, where is that? I think it's at Doolin. Isn't Doolin. It? Oh, didn't hear about that. I was also going to add that on Saturday. I think is the recycling extravaganza at the property yard on Saturday. So bring all your CFLs you've been holding. Yeah, right. It's 
Yes. All right. Any? Yeah. And the Budget and Finance Committee meets on Thursday morning, and we will be discussing revenue sharing. So if anyone's up and ready to go at 8 a.m., stop in. I think it'll be a good meeting. Hmm. I think I have to take my spouse to the airport at early that day, so I may just miss that fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, looks like we have minutes to one meeting. Uh, Mr. Take Mayor. Mike Duncan. Uh, Adam Clark on line 420 of those minutes. We had previously indicated that Mayor Tarter recused himself from that item, and here he, no, he did not vote. He, he's not that much of a scoundrel, but he did open the matter to the public, and I believe he was not even in the room. So I believe the vice mayor opened the matter to the public, and then in the next line, I believe the vice mayor asked the clerk to call the roll. Thank and, you. And with those corrections, I move adoption of the minutes of June 26, 2017. You second, second. You want to call roll? Uh, uh, no, that's fine. If you okay, just do a, do a voice vote. Voice, all right. Sure. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Abstain. Oh, I'm sorry. One abstention. Oh, two. Of two are not there. Yeah. Okay. Two then. All right, so uh, I'm going to read a motion or about um, our closed session. Upon a motion made by Council Member Z and seconded by Council Member Connolly and passed by voice vote of Council. Council wanted a closed session pursuant to Virginia Code VA. Section 2.2-3711A28 for discussion or consideration of information subject to the exclusion and subdivision 11 of Virginia Code Section 2.2-3705.6 for making such information public prior to entering into an interim or comprehensive agreement will adversely affect the financial interest or bargaining position of the public entity. Council Member Connolly. Yes. Duncan. Yes. Hardy. Yes. Lichtenhouse. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Z. Yes. Tartar, yes. Okay. So do we need a moment to take down the cameras and yes, the microphones? Please. Sorry, I want to take a five minute break for restrooms and the like and come on back in and for a brief closed session. We are coming out of closed session. Upon a motion made by council member Connolly. Seconded by Council Member Duncan. And passed by Vote of City Council. Council reconvened in open session. Vice Mayor Connolly. Yes. Councilmember Duncan. Yes. Hardy. Yes. Lichtenhouse. Yes. Snyder. Z. Yes. Tartar. Yes. All right. It is 958. Here's our certification. Upon a motion made by council member Z. Seconded by council member Connolly. And passed upon affirmative roll call vote in open session, it was certified that only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session or meeting by the City Council. Vice Mayor Connolly? Yes. Councilmember Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Lichtenhouse? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Z? Yes. Tartar? Yes. All right. Anything else to be said tonight? Mayor, move that we adjourn. All right. I think we're playing. Let's do it. We're adjourned.